algorithm devices. Uh, he is the creator of Dr. AFib, which is his platform get, dedicated to patient education on the condition. Uh, and he is also the author of uh, Your Complete Guide to AFib. Uh, so uh, is there anything you'd like to add to that um, pretty extensive bio? No, or, I, I think uh, you covered the high points. Thank you, Shannon, for that kind introduction. Of course. I am a nurse, surgical ICU nurse. That's my clinical background, so mm -hmm. I am... Super excited to, um, you know, lead this discussion today. I moderate, I should say, and yeah. uh, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, get down to it. So, um, Dr. Morales, can you just give us a brief overview of uh, what a stroke is for those in the audience that don't know? Sure. Just to give a brief overview, a stroke is basically damage that happens to the brain tissue because of a lack of blood flow and. It can happen for a variety of reasons. It can happen uh, for because of blockage, that something that builds up over a period of time that can be kind of kind of the equivalent of what people think of as a heart attack where either blockage or plaque builds up over a period of time and it finally just gets to that point over a period of several years and it ends up blocking blood supply to a certain part of the brain. Or it can happen suddenly where actual blood clot coming from somewhere else in the body, like an AFib, which we'll talk about, the blood clot actually goes suddenly to the brain and actually suddenly disrupts the blood flow to the brain. And when the blood flow to the brain is blocked off, it can start to uh, damage the brain and even tissue death can happen in those areas of the brain within just a few minutes. Uh, fortunately, with a stroke, you know, time is viable uh, tissue and stroke recovery. And there's been a lot of advances in stroke care to where when people get treatment sooner uh, or they present to the hospital as soon as possible, that blood flow can be restored with either medications or even procedures to minimize the effects of that, that stroke. Absolutely. So we have stroke. And now can you give us a little bit of an overview about AFib, and then we'll get into why those, those two are connected. Right. I mean, AFib is a very close correlation with stroke, which we'll talk about. But AFib is the most common heart arrhythmia worldwide, um, depending on which source that you look at. In the U.S., it's probably somewhere around 5 million people across the United States that have AFib. Across the world, over 30 million people have atrial fibrillation. So it is constantly growing and more people getting more and more atrial fibrillation. And it is an irregular heart rhythm. And so it's kind of more of an electrical disease to the heart as opposed to a heart attack, which is more of kind of a plumbing uh, disease of the heart. But it's more of an electrical issue. It makes the heart beat erratically, very rapidly. And more importantly, in the top chambers of the heart, the heart doesn't really squeeze normally. I kind of tell patients that, you know, if the heart, top heart squeezes normally like that, they're an AFib that just kind of just quivers, you know, it just kind of doesn't move, it goes so fast that it doesn't even move very much. And then the blood becomes stagnant, again, then subsequently lead to a stroke. Okay, great. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, so like you said, um, you know, there's a, a strong correlation between the two. And I have this interesting fact of a fourth of all strokes after age 40 are actually caused by AFib. Uh, yeah. So when do you mind just going into a little bit more detail uh, for us about about that connection? Yeah, I mean, it is a tremendous connection between AFib and stroke, you know, and depending on the source that you look, you can be anywhere from maybe one in four to one in seven, you know, it's usually around that 25 to 30% range of all strokes being caused by atrial fibrillation. So there's a very strong correlation. And mm -hmm. it's sort of a reason why it happens is because of the blood clots that can happen during atrial fibrillation. Now I have a little heart model here. We'll see if it shows well in the uh, video over here, but this is a, a heart model right here. And right, this is, right here is the left atrium right here. This is the left upper chamber of the heart. Atrial fibrillation comes from the word atrium, which is the top chambers of the heart, okay? And in the front of this left upper chamber of the heart, there's a little part here called the left atrial appendage. This is like a small little finger or small little pocket that's part of the, the left atrium. And if you open up the heart a little bit, you kind of might be able to see a little pocket in here and it's kind of like a blind alley or a cul-de-sac as part of the left atrium. It's actually a very small portion of the left atrium and in humans it actually contributes very little to the normal function of the heart itself. But it's kind of like the appendix of the heart. It doesn't contribute to the fit that much, but so in atrial fibrillation, this area is where most blood clots form. And this little pocket right here is where the grand majority of blood clots, around 90% of blood clots form right here in this little part. And this is where the grand majority of 
strokes come from is because a blood clot forms in this little area and then at some point it'll break off and go to the brain and, and, and obstruct flow and end up causing a stroke. So that's where the main risk comes from, from this little spot right here. And I'm sure we'll get into it, but there's mm -hmm. actually options to try to remove or get rid of that appendage to reduce risk of stroke as well. Wow, okay, yes, and, and thank you for bringing that uh, model. That helps to, to visualize it as yeah, well. Yeah, I hope you're able to see it well through the, through the phone and through the Instagram Live. Yep, yep, we can. Uh, and, and so I, I see here, AFib-related strokes are nearly twice as fatal um, and disabling as non-AFib-related strokes. Why is that? You know, I don't have a clear understanding of why, but the, I've seen that data several times. I've seen that it's more disabling or more fatal. And it might just be because it's the, a very sudden blood flow. And, you know, the, uh, there can be pretty large blood clots that develop in that left atrial appendage, you know, and it just mm -hmm. develops very, very suddenly, you know, in, in patients. And, and that's probably the mechanism why it's a little bit more uh, disabling compared to the other more ischemic vasculature also tends to kind of something that maybe builds up over a period of time, whereas the one at AFib, you know, there may not be any much blockage in the brain circulation, but it just gets blocked off suddenly by a, by a blood clot. A cryptogenic stroke specifically and AFib, uh, what's the connection between those two? So first to let people know, the cryptogenic stroke is basically a stroke where nobody can figure out where it came from. You know, it, that's the basically definition of what it is. And mm -hmm. I can tell you how many patients I've seen that, you know, they got, they had a stroke, they clearly had a stroke, or maybe they recovered from a stroke, had a mini stroke, and they got all their tests done in the hospital. They got an MRI done, they had circulations of their, of their uh, vasculature, or the carotid artery checked. They had a uh, monitor war for brief periods of time. And they couldn't find anything. And they just said, well, you have a stroke, but we really don't know why, you know? And mm -hmm. a significant portion of these can be due to AFib. There's some studies that have said up to a third of cryptogenic strokes can be due to AFib. And part well, of the reason is that because AFib comes and goes. You know, people aren't in AFib all the time, you know? So they may have, especially in those earlier times when people have AFib, you may have an episode of AFib that lasts maybe about a couple of hours, and then you don't have another one for several months later on. And then if you're getting testing done when you're not in AFib, it's not getting picked up. And so that's leads to the trouble in diagnosing it. And there have been some studies where they've actually put kind of these small monitors that go underneath the skin called implantable monitor. And they monitor people who had a cryptogenic stroke for a prolonged period of time. And the average amount of time to finally detect AFib was around 80 days. And so the people, it can actually take a long period of monitoring to kind of figure out if a person had a stroke due to AFib. So when I meet somebody in the hospital and they've had a stroke and they don't really know why it happened, I say, you know what, we're going to do our essential tests in the hospital, but then there still needs to be more work after the hospital, more work to try to figure out could AFib have caused this stroke because that ultimately detecting that AFib is going to help prevent a second stroke. Absolutely. And I, I think that's a, a nice segue into this question, uh, diagnosing AFib. What's the best way to go about that? Um, you know, of course, like you said, after a stroke, you know, sometimes it's it, it's too late at that point. So, uh, what do you do um, beforehand to try and to diagnose AFib? Well, to diagnose AFib, you know, many times the first symptoms are something that people feel. You know, and most commonly people will feel the heart kind of skipping or racing or just all of a sudden going fast. You can just be sitting down like your eye and then all of a sudden your heart just starts going to the races, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that's the sort of a symptom that people will commonly feel, especially when they're first originally di di uh, diagnosed and they'll come to the doctor and say, my heart just starts racing all of a sudden, you know, and then they'll have to do some testing, which would usually will involve wearing a hot heart monitor to see if they can catch an episode of, of atrial fibrillation or potentially some other reason that's causing their heart to race. The tricky thing is that some people also have more subtle symptoms, something that's not you, where you can't clearly pinpoint and say that's a fib. Some people mm -hmm. just say, I have some days I'm more short of breath. Some people just say, hey, some days I'm really tired. And you have to kind of catch those episodes when they're having a fib. And there are really people who just get truly diagnosed accidentally. I mean, they're just going to their doctor for a regular checkup. The doctor listens to them. They say, you know what? I've heard something irregular, they do an EKG, and they're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. So there's a really a wide spectrum in terms of how people present with atrial fibrillation. So it can be tricky to diagnose it. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot more of 
consumer products coming out now that have, that have allowed over the last few years that have allowed more detection of atrial fibrillation easier than ever before. Um, a common one was an Apple Watch. I mean, many people may have an Apple Watch and they get some alert and then they end up doing that in ECG, simple ECG on their watch and then picks up AFib. There's, and there's other similar consumer products as well that have actually aided in helping to diagnose AFib because like I mentioned, people, especially at the beginning, are not in AFib all the time. I mean, they may have episodes <laughs> that last for you know a day and then they don't have anything again for six months. And so catching it while it's happening is the biggest key to actually diagnosing somebody with AFib. Yeah, and it's it's amazing, like you said, what technologies are out there, like the Apple Watch, um, that can help detect um, these these arrhythmias. I tell people when it comes to the Apple Watch or other monitors, like there's a cardio, the one called the Cardio Mobile, which I think is great. It's actually one that I most recommend to people because it's much cheaper than a, than an Apple Watch. You know, if you only want to monitor uh, somebody with a fit, it's a tool. It's a tool. Don't rely on the the watch itself or the Cardio Mobile to diagnose your fit. If you get, if you take a good quality picture, no matter what the machine says, whatever what the Apple Watch says, if you show it to your doctor or a qualified healthcare professional knows to read it, it's going to be amazing information, you know. So even if it's not the, you know, you don't get everything answered from the watch directly, your healthcare, your doctor, your EP, your cardiologist will be able to look at that picture and say it is this, it is not this, and so in that setting, it's a very amazing tool. And so you know, we have our diagnosis. What about treatment? Uh, maybe starting with blood thinners to reduce the risk of stroke in, in patients with AFib? Well, the standard treatment for a long time has been blood, blood thinning medication. I mean, there was studies going as far back as the 80s, I believe, when some of the first studies looking at blood thinners for atrial fibrillation to reduce risk of stroke, which the main comparisons back then were just either aspirin or warfarin. And those are kind of the two options. You know, as I mentioned, the main risk for stroke for AFib is because of blood clot forms in that in the heart, particularly in the left atrial appendage. And so those were the medications that would help reduce mm -hmm. risk of stroke. Fortunately, since 2009, I believe was the, the first one, there's a whole category of newer blood thinning medications as well uh, that help reduce risk of stroke. That includes very popular blood thinning medications like Eliquis, Xarelto, Pradaxa, Cervesa. And so these have pretty much replaced warfarin for the most part in terms of blood thinners for atrial fibrillation because they work better. I mean, they are very consistent blood thinners. The bleeding risk is a little bit better compared to warfarin. And so they really have, by and large, replaced uh, warfarin for blood thinning, uh, for uh, reducing risk for stroke from AFib. I mean, the data is across the board is usually somewhere around 70% stroke risk reduction when you take a blood thinner. And, and the bleeding risk is usually around 2% two, two to 2%, uh, roughly. And so because it's very reliable blood thinners, they tend they pretty much have replaced warfarin. These days, the only reason why I prescribe somebody warfarin to reduce risk of stroke rapid is mostly for cost-related reasons. I mean, there may, may be some people whose plans or these newer blood thinners are just too expensive and they can't afford copays. And so in those, case, those cases, then I would use warfarin still, but grand majority are these newer blood thinning medications that have come out over the last 10 years or so, which I've really worked well for a lot of people. And it's still the tried and true method for uh, reducing risk of stroke, but they are blood thinners, of course. And so there's obviously gonna be a, a bleeding risk. Right, exactly. And can we dive a little bit into that, uh, into that bleeding risk more? Um, yeah. What do you advise your patients, um, you know, to be careful for when they're um, either at home or, you know, another, another right. living situation? Mm -hmm. Right, and, and so there's a difference between you know, what I would say minor bleeding or minor complications from the medication versus more serious ones. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, anybody on a blood thinner is probably going to bruise easily, you know, especially the, most people who have AFib are older in age, there's, their, their subdermal tissue is a little bit thinner, so they're more likely to bruise easily and have more bruising because they're on blood thinning medication. And that's, you know, can look ugly, but it's usually not anything that causes harm uh, to the patient. But then there's also clinically relevant uh, bleeding, which is include, may include things like nosebleeds or blood in the urine, which maybe doesn't cause pain or problem, but certainly is noticeable to the patient. And there's obviously more major bleeding. More major bleeding usually come from the gastrointestinal tract, like the colon or stomach. And those can usually cause major, major bleeding where people end up in the hospital needing transfusions and, and urgent treatment for that. So certainly signs of, of bleeding is certainly something to be very uh, careful with for people who are on blood thinners for AFib. 
And it's so important for patients to be aware of the medications they're on and what they cause, um, you know, just in case they end up do having a stroke and they go to the ED. Um, they need to know that if, if um, you know, they're trying to give them TPA, uh, the, the clinical team. So it's, it's very important for um, the patient, their friends, family, caretaker to be aware of, of these potential risks associated with blood thinners. And, and fortunately, with these risk of blood thinners, very, very recently, within the last year or two, I believe all of them now have reversal agents, which are just IV, and they're available in the hospital and emergency room. So if you're really having a dangerous, life-threatening, or bleeding, I'm sorry, from the blood thinner, they can usually uh, reverse it pretty quickly with the, these neural agents. In, in terms of other forms of treatment, procedures, uh, what, what type of procedures are available? Right, so there are several actual procedures as well that can also help reduce risk of stroke from AFib. And that's an important thing to discuss because like I mentioned, you know, blood thinners have been around a long time, they work great, and they're probably step number one to reduce risk of stroke when somebody has AFib. And they're the standard of care. I mean, they're, they're, they're option of number one, but then there are many patients who have clinically relevant bleeding or they have significant issues with, with taking a blood thinner. And until these more options were kind of more available within the last few years, these patients who were on blood thinners were in this nonstop cycle where they would take a blood thinner, well, they got a bleeding episode, okay, stop your blood thinner for about a month. Okay, you're better now, okay, start taking it again. Okay, well, now you had some bleeding in your, in your stool, okay, stop it again. Okay, well, and the cycle would just continue over and over again because they're just prone to bleeding, but they also have a high risk of stroke. And so they were kind of stuck in this endless cycle and fortunately now there are a couple of different options to reduce risk of stroke involving procedures which can eventually get people off of blood thinning medications. Um, there's more invasive versions and they're both, and there's le less invasive versions and they involve sealing off the left atrial pain. So actually kind of closing it off or eliminating it from the circulation. Uh, the main one that has been studied the most is a procedure called a Watchman. A watchman is a procedure where, kind of similar to heart catheterization, uh, they go in through their groin just with a needle puncture, take a catheter that goes up to their heart. And so from the inside, they actually go in and basically it looks like a little plug and they seal this area off and just kind of makes it flush, nice and sealed off. And after someone gets that, you still need to take blood thinner for the protocol, but only for about six weeks. That's about how long it takes for that plug to completely seal off that appendage from the, from the rest of the body. And then after that, you don't really need those really strong blood thinners anymore. So that's kind of like the most minimally invasive version to do that. Uh, it's been studied in several clinical trials. I mean, there's thousands of patients' data now over a period of 10 years to show how safe and effective an, an option that can be. Another option is actually with, with a surgery. Like I said, you had a bypass surgery or a heart valve surgery, but they would actually just sew it down. There's been several different instruments that basically kind of suture it down from, from the outside to also close it off. And there's kind of minimally invasive ways to do it. Not as invasive as, a, not as minimally invasive as a catheter, but you still kind of make an incision along your side over here and, and clip it off from the side. And that's been something that's been going on for a while now, but actually just very recently, it's actually just recently in the last uh, American College of Cardiology conference, which is just going on right now, there was a new study that showed that this also reduces risk of stroke. So it's something that was done for a long time, but this didn't have the study evidence to back it up that it also reduced risk of stroke sealing off. So clearly uh, sealing off the left atrial appendage, whether that's with a Watchman plug or with a surgical closure, reduces risk of stroke. It's never 100%. I've had patients who have had a Watchman or have had a, hundred, a closure dependence and they still have had a stroke. Fortunately, there have been several studies that show that if that appendage is sealed off, the strokes can be more minor. They're, they're strokes, but they're less okay. disabling. They're less major strokes. And so there's really a lot of benefit to mm -hmm. uh, excluding that left atrial appendage. Okay, great. So there's a, a few, thank you for explaining those few different options uh, that patients have. And um, I, I know that this question might tie in with prevention a bit too, um, mm -hmm. but what role does a healthy lifestyle play in treating AFib? So there's actually several things that a healthy lifestyle can do to either not only improve AFib, but then also reduce risk of stroke as well. Mm -hmm. um, the main way that you're, a person's doctor can figure out what a person's risk of stroke is, is a scoring system called the chads vask scoring system. It's a very commonly used, it's the most commonly used across, across the United States. And each one of these chads vask initials stands for something. It stands for congestive heart failure, 
hypertension, age, diabetes, whether you've had a stroke in the past. So there's several risk factors which are kind of calculated to see an overall risk of stroke, and that influences whether a doctor needs blood thinners or what your overall risk of stroke is. But healthy lifestyle, like losing weight and, you know, and cutting out sodium or you know, foods that are unhealthy and processed food, you might reduce high blood pressure. You might reduce or eliminate diabetes, and those would bring down your total risk score. And so a risk score that somebody has when they're first diagnosed is not always what it's going to always forever be. If a person chooses to get you know, a healthier lifestyle, loses weight, that can also reduce your overall risk of stroke as well to where maybe you don't need blood thinners or, or maybe your risk of stroke gets lower because of that. In addition, mm -hmm. these same things can also reduce AFib as well. I mean, I've seen many patients that also reduce symptoms of AFib by a healthier lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And another thing to factor in with, with uh, risk of stroke is, is smoking. And people who smoke and have AFib have a much higher risk of stroke uh, than people who do not smoke. And, and quitting smoking can reduce that risk of stroke as well. Okay, great. Yeah. And um, so that, that covered most of the topics that I wanted to get through. Um, I think it's, it's clear that all these cardiovascular conditions are so intertwined with each other. Um, one can lead to the other, you know, stroke to AFib, diabetes, um, any other cardiovascular disease. Right. On a parting note, we're, we're a little short on time here, but just in honor of Stroke Awareness Month, uh, do you mind going over the signs and symptoms of a stroke FAST, if you would? <laughs> yeah, so FAST is an acronym which stands for FACE yep. is, a, is one of your, you know, these are the symptoms to notice, notify if there's any change or, you know, sudden changes. So FACE is it's one half, usually it's one half of your face and you, you see notice like a dripping of the eyelid or dripping of the lip. Uh, arm with if one of the arms is just not moving or significantly weaker than the other one. Uh, mm -hmm. Speech, uh, if you're noticing that you either can't talk or your, your talk has been significantly affected very suddenly. And then the last T is just time, which kind of goes back to what we were talking about uh, recently uh, at the beginning was that time is key. And with all the advances that have happened with stroke care and improving blood flow to the brain as soon as possible significantly reduces the long-term damage of a stroke. So time is, is very important. Yep, time is brain, as we like yeah. to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you.